My next topic is talking about PARP inhibitors for castration-resistant prostate cancer. So uh, we know that our, we've, we're seeing further definition of the genetics behind prostate cancer, and we know that there are certain germline mutations that are frequented in this disease, particularly those that are involved with DNA repair. BRCA2 is the predominant mutation, whereas ATM, CHECK2, BRCA1 are seen at a lesser amount. And then there is smattering of other uh, DNA repair mutations that are present. I think the one that we really also have to keep in mind is microsatellite instability, otherwise known as MSH2 or MSH6, because these markers will mark for sensitivity to pembrolizumab. And I've, I've actually had a couple of cases where we've had some dramatic responses in soft tissue lesions, declines in PSA, and for fairly durable periods of time with pembrolizumab, and this is really the only situation where I could justify immunotherapy in this, this, setting, this setting. So this is just a summary of all the DNA repair gene mutations in seven metastatic castration-resistant uh, uh, studies, 800, 692 patients, uh, 82 patients with mutations for an overall percentage rate of 10.8%. So we do have drugs that target uh, those patients with DNA repair mutations, whether that be germline or somatic, and these are the PARP inhibitors. PARP inhibitors have multiple functions, including inhibiting DNA repair, causing regulation of transcription. Uh, there's actually a co-repressor called Groucho that uh, I actually like uh, that uh, is involved in uh, translocation in the nucleus and, and uh, complexes with PARP. PARP. It also has, it looks like a cigar-shaped one, which is appropriate. Uh, we also have chromatin modification, mitosis inhibition, as well as apoptosis and cell death. So this is concept of synthetic lethality. And the issue really here is, is that we have both double-stranded and, and single-stranded ways of repairing DNA. And uh, the double-stranded repair pathway, of course, is modulated by BRCA. It's actually jumped ahead. And then the single, pa a single base excision pair pathway can actually be knocked out uh, by the PARP inhibitors. So you get this concept called synthetic lethality, where cells with both of these repair mechanisms inhibited can apoptose and die. The first indication that there was a effect uh, of PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer came from the TOPARP trial, where 49 patients who had previously been on docetaxel were treated with olaparib, uh, 37 responded, and these were 32% responded, and these were unselected patients. When they went ahead and did a, a genomic analysis of these patients, they found that 16 of those patients had mutations in the DNA repair pathway, it's a third of all patients, and 14 of those 16 patients responded. Of the remaining patients, two patients responded who did not have DNA repair mutations, and so again, this was an indication that this was a way to mark for sensitivity to PARP inhibitors. So phase three trial was designed along those, this particular observation. Uh, this is the profound trial, which took men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. They had to have progression on one novel uh, hormonal agent, such as abiraterone or enzalutamide. Uh, they had to have alterations in at least one gene of DNA repair. Uh, these patients were stratified into two different cohorts. One was cohort A, which were the BRCA1, BRCA2s, and the ATMs. Cohort B was basically all of the other mutations. And then they were randomized to 300 milligrams of Olaparib BID, or the physician's choice of care. The primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. The secondary endpoints were overall survival uh, and uh, confirmed objective response rate. These were the genes that were analyzed, and as we see, BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, BRP1, BARD, uh, CDK12, CHECK1, CHECK2, FANKL, PALB2, and then the, the whole RAD series. And you had to have at least one of these genes altered, and that was found in 28% of all the uh, samples that were screened. It's more than 2,000 samples that were screened for the study. So from these select patients, of course, then they, were, they, they were then randomized. So this is the primary endpoint of the study, the radiographic progression-free survival in cohort A. As we see, there's about a four-month improvement in RPFS. The hazard ratio, I think, is more impressive. It's 0.34. And uh, if we look at 12 months, 28% versus 9% of patients uh, have uh, not progressed. As we see in the uh, RPFS by uh, both cohorts, A and B, again, that 
median survival is preserved. The hazard ratio is a little bit higher, uh, 0 0.49. Uh, when we look at all the different subgroups, I think we, we see a very, very interesting pattern. Uh, firstly, it didn't matter what the PSAs were, the geographic site, the age, the economic performance status. Uh, but we see that there are certain mutations that tend to do better and some that do, tend to do worse. The hazard ratio for ATM was right around one. Uh, check one, check two, maybe a little bit better. Uh, but the PPP 2R2A uh, mutation actually did worse with the PARP inhibitors, and there's really been no good explanation. Perhaps it was small numbers, uh, but again, uh, the predominant responders here were BRCA1 and BRCA2. So this is the overall survival. As we see, there's an improvement in OS with a P value of 0 0.02, uh, a three-month difference in the median. So again, that's, I think, impressive. I've had some patients who've had some fairly durable responses, particularly with visceral disease. Uh, this is a fairly well-tolerated drug. As, as one would expect, there is a slightly higher rate of grade three or higher adverse events in the Olaparib arm versus the physician's choice arm. Uh, dose reductions, 22%, and then discontinuation, 16% overall. That's higher than what you would see in the physician's choice. And that's usually abiraterone or enzalutamide. We know that those drugs don't work consecutively. And I think, again, that's, that's also a bit of a critique of the trial. The, 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 the chances of the, the, the control arm working were not great, but there was really no other alternative. So what did this, does this mean for our clinical practice? Well, the FDA last year approved uh, Olaparib for those patients who have HRRG-mutated metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So this is a very, very broad indication. It includes all of these DNA repair genes that I talked about previously, not just BRCA1, BRCA2. And patients only have to have received uh, a next-generation antiandrogen. They don't need to receive chemotherapy to be eligible according to the FDA approval. Are there other approved PARP inhibitors? The answer is yes. This is the Triton II trial, uh, which is a phase two study. And uh, this was designed to get accelerated approval of the drug for castration-resistant prostate cancer. Again, a very, very similar gene pattern, uh, uh, and patients had to be screened prior to going on study. Uh, they could have received uh, a uh, chemotherapeutic agent, such as docetaxel, and a next-generation antiandrogen. So it's a little bit more advanced than what we saw with the, uh, the group in uh, uh, the uh, PROFOUND trial. They can't have received a PARP inhibitor or a platin-based therapy, mitoxantrone or cyclophosphamide. They received recaparib at 600 milligrams orally, and then they were assessed for response. And the primary endpoint of this, this study was objective response, as you would see in any accelerated trial. Uh, this is the enrollment, 85 patients, predominantly BRCA1, BRCA2 again, some ATMs. Uh, and uh, this is the radiographic response uh, for the study, 44% uh, having objective response, no ATMs, no CDK12s uh, responding in that initial analysis. Biochemical response parallels what we see with the objective soft tissue response, 50% response rate uh, as measured by 50% PSA decline in BRCA1, BRCA2s, but the same pattern again. Uh, lower response rate, really no responses with ATMs, low response rate with CDK12s, and then two of, no, two of nine for the other uh, non-BRCA mutations. Uh, I neglected to put this in the, in the first part of the presentation, but you can see that the response rates for both of these drugs are comparable. Odds ratio for, for Olaparib is uh, 20%. Uh, this is an ad hoc analysis of some of the DDR genes, again, with further follow-up. We did see some responses in ATMs, but again, this is predominantly a BRCA1, BRCA2 group. Safety, again, the same pattern that we saw with, with, uh, uh, with Olaparib. 95% uh, at least one treatment-related adverse events, half of which were grade three, um, and half had a dose reduction uh, or treatment interruption. Uh, so just, just again, uh, let me just move forward here. Uh, with Triton II, the FDA uh, then granted uh, uh, accelerated approval based upon this data and uh, patients who would receive prior androgen receptor direct therapy as well as a taxane, so it's a little bit different than Olaparib. Uh, there is a phase three trial called Triton III, which is a very similar population to uh, the PROFOUNDS trial. This hopefully will be positive and then one could get, get full approval based upon this, but this is an accelerated approval at this point. So to summarize, 
in terms of toxicities that we have to watch out for, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia, we should generally check a CBC every other week. That's what I generally do. Nausea, fatigue, and asthenia. Patients do need sometimes transfusions or the use of agents such as darbopoietin uh, to maintain their blood counts. Liver enzyme elevations can be seen, but most of these adverse events are low grade. So as we saw before, PARP inhibitors are useful for a select population, 10 to 20 percent of all prostate cancer patients. How can we use the biology of the disease to potentially increase the response rates as well as the population that could receive a PARP inhibitor? Well, there are a number of different trials combining Olaparib with either DNA damaging agents. Testosterone actually has a DNA damaging effect, and uh, uh, deprivation of testosterone can actually cause the, uh, the uh, uh, reduction in DNA repair enzymes. Uh, so there are a variety of different ways that this is going about. There are also studies that are combining Rucaparib uh, with uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and that's actually a, a common uh, theme that's going on at this particular point. But there are ways that, that, that PARP can, uh, can uh, cause effects besides DNA repair. It will pr promote oncogenic phenotypes. It's also recruited at the sites of the androgen receptor and ERG, and will also support uh, uh, transcriptional function, so therefore inhibition of PARP can affect the transcription, and uh, tr castrate resistance cells will also inc show increased PARP activity. You can combine PARP with angin-targeted therapies, and as we see from this uh, study that was performed uh, in the in VCAP xenografts, uh, that there is a synergy between this combination. And this has been uh, evaluated in, in several different trials, but the thought is that you can potentially induce brachiness by decreasing gene expression that's involved in DNA repair, uh, dec decreasing double-stranded break repair, and also potentially increasing radiosensitivity. So there are a number of ways this can, be, can go about. The first attempt at this was actually unfortunately negative. Uh, this is a trial combining abiraterone and prednisone, uh, and comparing that to abiraterone, prednisone, plus valaparib, which is a, uh, a PARP inhibitor. Uh, the outcomes in terms of PSA declines were very, very similar. The objective response rates were very, very similar between the two different arms. And uh, when we start looking on somatic mutations, uh, there did seem to be uh, some correlation with that, but it did not increase what we call brachiness. In this trial that compared abiraterone uh, combined with alaparib to placebo combined with, uh, compared to alaparib, there was an improvement in, uh, sorry, placebo combined with abiraterone. There was an improvement in radiographic progression-free survival as assessed by the investigator, uh, but there was no difference in overall survival. But what I think was the important take home from this message, uh, from this study, is the fact that if you had a wild type patient, there did seem to be some improvement in RPFS. Granted that these are small numbers, uh, but this actually may be some evidence that we can actually increase brachiness by causing further androgen deprivation at the time of the administration of PARP inhibitors. The only problem with this combination is the fact that there is a high rate of, higher rate of cardiovascular events, uh, only one in the abiraterone alone arm, but four MIs in the combination and one fatal cardiac failure uh, also as well. So, so this is something that needs to be monitored. There is a randomized trial right now that is, final, where there is further testing this hypothesis. Hypoxia. Hypoxia can be shown to downregulate DNA double-stranded repair and thus can be a way that we can also increase brachiness in the cells. Uh, and this is some data that uh, has been generated with the DU145 and PC3 prostate cancer cell lines that you can actually see uh, in, in, a, a down regulation of these DNA repair enzymes when these cells are exposed to anti-angiogenesis agents. Uh, Joe Kim at my institution has been working hard at looking at sidernib as an inducer of hypoxia and castrate-resistant prostate cancer. As we see it with the vehicle uh, versus the uh, 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 versus the sidernib, which is a anti-angiogenesis agent, uh, there's actually increased hypoxia when you administer this. So Joe has actually completed a randomized trial uh, with alaparib and sidernib in castrate-resistant prostate cancer testing the hypothesis that there would be a higher response rate in uh, those patients uh, who received the combination. So he took patients who had two prior therapies, ECOG-001, randomized them to sidernib plus olaparib versus olaparib, 
and the primary endpoint was patient progression-free survival, secondary endpoint was OS, uh, and then uh, patients were biopsied at baseline in every four weeks, and it was 42 patients per arm. So it worked in a significant subset of castrate-resistant disease, mostly in patients who had lost the function of DNA repair, but it did not increase brachiness in these patients. And what I think was actually the important thing from this was that we did see some responses in ATM. There was an improvement in unselecting patients in radiographic PFS, but again, when we did the gene, when Joe did the gene analysis, it seemed to be limited to those patients with BRCA1, BRCA2. So in conclusion, PARP inhibition is an effective uh, method of treatment in patients with DNA repair mutations and castrate-resistant disease. It seems to be less effective in those patients who have ATM mutations. Olaparib is FDA-approved in castrate-resistant disease in patients with gene mutations uh, who have been treated with enzalutamide or abiraterone, and then rucaparib is approved in those patients who are BRCA1, BRCA2, and who have received abiraterone or enzalutamide and docetaxel. So we have, I, I think, another therapeutic modality for our patients, and uh, the future with combining these agents, I think, looks very, very bright. 